All right. Well, my name is Tom Holden. I'm the former director here at the Lake Superior Maritime Visitor Center with the Corps of Engineers. I was here about 36 uh, years uh, active, and then I retired in January of 2013. And since that time, I've been kind of a on again, off again volunteer. Um, shipwrecks and lighthouses have been uh, kind of my passion for a long time. I started with uh, shipwreck history back when I was a uh, actually preteen, and I uh, have continued it and expanded my interest from just those around Isle Royal National Park to include most of Lake Superior now and a little bit but, uh, down in the St. Mary's River, but pretty much uh, sticking with uh, um, the area here around Duluth Superior and Lake Superior. I've always kind of wanted to be a lighthouse keeper. I don't know if it would be a real good position for me because I, I do like to see people now and then, but um, I've always liked this lighthouse keeper photo. It came from the, the Coast Guard Historical Collection and it's the keeper's unidentified, but I kind of liked him. He's kind of a handsome guy, has a nice mustache, uh, loved his bib overalls, and I kind of liked the idea that no one knew who he was. So I did give him a name. Uh, his name now is uh, Wickstrom Edward Bibbs, also known as Wiki Bibbs or Keeper Bibbs or just Mr. Bibbs. So if you happen to see me around town uh, most any time, I'll be wearing a similar set of overalls. Pretty easy to find me. Just a little bit about where the uh, information comes from for today's program. Uh, got to a couple of quick footnotes here to put in the beginning. One is a, a book called the, the Luck of the Draw um, about Tafa, which is the, the main shipwreck we'll be talking about. And it was done by Robert uh, Abrahamson. I will tell you that this book is um, it's kind of like a docudrama in, in that it's a mixture of actual factual history. And then he fills in some of the, the, the spaces in between um, using his imagination and thinking about what's really uh, happening. And um, so it's, it's really a fascinating book to read and it's a fairly quick read. So um, A Luck of the Draw by uh, Bob Abrahamson. Another is a fairly new book also is um, called So Terrible a Storm, A Tale of Theory on Lake Superior, and it really concentrates on the, the storm uh, that we'll be talking about and the Metapha shipwreck, as well as the other ships that were involved in this same storm. It was written by Kurt Brown, who was a newspaper person from uh, down in Minneapolis, St. Paul. And then last, uh, one by Julius F. Wolf, Wolf uh, Lake Superior Shipwrecks. Um, this edition that you see here is uh, the latest edition. It was done in 1989. Um, and it's really a compendium of more than 2,000 shipwrecks and accidents on Lake Superior. So it's kind of the Bible reference for shipwrecks on Lake Superior. And there's the 1905 section is um, pretty extensive and does talk about each of the 29 ships that had some sort of accident uh, in this one storm. Um, today, although it's August 6th, today and tomorrow is, uh, as August 7th, the Lighthouse Day here in the Twin Ports and nationwide. Um, this is our 18th annual Lighthouse Day and it was really just uh, a day um, picked several years ago to commemorate the, or bring attention to really the, the lighthouses that we have here in the Twin Ports. Um, we have quite a collection here, um, and also there's a big collection over in Bayfield and the Apostle Islands. So there's lots of lighthouses here on the west end of Lake Superior. We'll be talking specifically about ones on the, really on the western end of Lake Superior. And the ones we'll get to today are listed at the top there, but um, Rock of Ages Lighthouse up at uh, the Minnesota end of Isle Royal, then uh, Split Rock Lighthouse on the Minnesota North Shore, the Two Harbors Lighthouse, um, just 25 miles from Duluth. And then in Duluth itself, uh, there's three lighthouses uh, right at the Duluth Ship Canal, this, this South Pier Outer Range Light or Pierhead Lighthouse. That's the one that's on all the time. Uh, in green, and then there's the inner range light, uh, which is the tall kind of open tower on the inner pier. Then on the north side is uh, the north pier head light. Um, that one's a red light that comes on uh, after dark. Then in Superior, we have the, the lighthouse right at the Superior entry out on the breakwater. 
And not too far from there is the Minnesota Point Lighthouse, which is the old one, it was built in 1858. And all that's really left is um, just most of the tower um, that still stands out there. It's also known as the Zero Point Lighthouse because it was used during the um, mapping of Duluth Superior Harbor, uh, which was completed back in 1861, uh, just three years after the lighthouse itself was built. And then there'll be a quick mention of the Outer Island Lighthouse and really uh, just a moment about its designer. So pretty much the, the western end of Lake Superior. So when you're talking about lighthouses, there's a couple of uh, different shapes or things that um, are kind of interesting. This, this word frustum has always been kind of interesting to me. It's a kind of an odd looking word. Um, and all it means is that um, if let's say we, we started out with a conical shape for a lighthouse, well, we know that you, you can't put the lighthouse up on the very top pointy part, so you cut it off. And once you cut off that peak or don't really build it there, that becomes the frustum of a cone. It's been truncated, it's been shortened. And so the top plane, the top smaller circle and the bottom circle, the base of it, are both flat parallel to one another. So that's the frustum of a cone. If we had a, um, a pyramidal shape uh, lighthouse and we took the top off or removed that, the point part, we're left with the frustum of a pyramid. And that's very much like the lighthouse that's um, right across from the ship canal, the inner range light. The other one, the conical one, um, that one is like the North Pier Head Lighthouse here in Duluth. So frustum is uh, one of those unusual words used to describe uh, lighthouse towers in particular. As far as storms go, we're gonna be talking about a particular storm. It occurred on November 27, 28, and 29 of 1905. And like I've written here, Lake Superior's tall water met steel ships and 29 ships came in second. Um, it's uh, Lake Superior's most devastating and widespread storm, even though it really covered only about half of the lake or a little more than half. Um, with those 29 ships lost or damaged in that single storm, there hasn't been another one that's even come close to that. Losses range from topside storm damage um, to groundings, total losses, and some ships that are still missing uh, out on Lake Superior. Even as great as the uh, Edmund Fitzgerald storm on November 9 and 10 of 1975, uh, even though we remember that storm and how big it was, we also remember that it only took one ship, and that was the Edmund Fitzgerald. Uh, it spared the Arthur M. Anderson and, other, and others throughout on Lake Superior. So this Metaphys storm is really important, uh, even though it was a long time ago, it's really important. If we look at this map of the Lake of Lake Superior and uh, where each of the little red dots are, kind of looks like we have measles on the lake, but um, give you an idea where most of the accidents occurred. Of course, there are a lot right around Duluth Superior itself. Uh, up the Minnesota North Shore, up around Thunder Bay, which in 1905 was Fort William and Port Arthur. Also at Isle Royal, up in the northern part of the lake, over in the Apostle Islands, um, about an hour and a half drive from the Twin Ports here. The Keweenaw Peninsula uh, of Upper Michigan, then the north central part of Lake Superior, and then kind of the western uh, central part of Lake Superior. And since we're talking about storms here, um, we should go back to the, the Weather Service, which actually began uh, in 1870. And here in Duluth, the, probably the earliest best known of the, those early meteorologists was this gentleman, H.W. Uh, Richardson. And it was his job to figure out what the storm was going to be like, try to come up with a forecast, uh, for that 1905 storm. He had just basic instruments. And one of the things that um, was occurring at that time, 1905, was his weather station up on the Duluth hillside was only a year old. It was built in 1904. And the building still stands, although it's a, resident, a residence now. He had just rudiments, rudimentary instruments. Um, he had uh, thermometers for measuring the air temperature. He uh, had a compass for knowing uh, the proper directions. 
a weather vane which indicated the direction that the wind was blowing, an anemometer um, with little cups on there, um, caught the wind and you could measure the wind speed then with the anemometer, a barometer which measured the air pressure, and with the barometer, one of the things you want to do is to keep track of whether it's rising and falling or uh, and exactly what the, um, the real reading is right now. Um, just that direction, whether it's becoming a higher pressure or lower pressure, um, that indicates what the future weather will be. And generally, if it's becoming higher pressure, we'll get better weather than we have now if the pr uh, pressure is falling, lower pressure, we'll have uh, worse weather than we have now. It doesn't mean it'll be terrible. It just means that it'll be worse than we have now. And so we have to really keep track of the time, whether we use the big banjo clock uh, mounted on the wall or, or just a hand uh, uh, a watch um, to keep track. We do need to keep track of the times that we take the readings. We also need a supply of uh, weather warning flags to indicate um, what the weather prediction is. Um, they'd be flown from a, a flag tower right next to the um, weather station up on the top of the hill. There's a variety of instruments up on the roof of the, the weather station and using those and the instruments he has in the, the, the house, which was his home as well as the office, um, it was his job to try and predict the weather. And the weather is really, um, it's a prediction. Um, it's a mixture of science and uh, not really the use of the crystal ball, but um, guessing a little bit what to expect. And in this case, um, he was able to figure out that there, um, yes, there was a storm. Um, you could look out the window and see that there was a storm and that it was gonna be a big storm, was gonna be intense. Um, but what he couldn't predict was something called retrograde. And usually when we think about storms on Lake Superior, they're moving, moving from the west um, to the east. So they're going from Duluth, let's say towards to St. Marie across Lake Superior. In our case, our storm, the Metapha storm, came through from the west, went out onto Lake Superior, and it's like it got stuck out there. It was almost like a boomerang. Um, it came back again, it retrograded. So we had it on um, the second half of the storm or second part of the first storm really came from the east to the west. So a little bit different than we usually get. It's not rare, um, but it's not real common either. So retrograde just meant that instead of the usual west to east storm, it was one that came from the east uh, in the second part. And also with that, the wind direction is generally um, out of the northeast uh, here in Duluth, uh, coming from the northeast. So if you stepped outside and you faced into the wind, you would be facing to the northeast. So nor'easters are the storms to worry about on the western end of Lake Superior. If you're over at Sault Ste. Marie, you worry about the nor'wester, where the storms come from the, the northwest down and push a lot of water into the area around Whitefish Bay and into the Sioux itself. Now, out of those 29 ships, somebody had to be first. And the first one to have an accident was this boat called the Monkshaven. It's, um, I usually say monk shaven. Sometimes uh, it, it um, can be read as monk's haven, as though it's a place where monks might go or be for their uh, uh, prayer time or uh, alone quiet time. So monk's haven. The story behind the name um, is not well documented, but generally um, the person who was in charge of naming the ship had grown up in Ireland and near the actual place that's called Monk's Haven. And they just push the two words together, much like we do a lot uh, now using the internet. So Monk's Haven was the first of the accidents. It wrecked up by Pie Island right at the entry to Thunder Bay and the northern part of the lake. Um, if you look at the boat here where it's wrecked, what we see off to the left, that piece of rock there is actually part of uh, Angus Island. It's a little tiny island right next to Pie Island. And you can see that it's pretty solidly aground. Um, it's not wiggling, wiggling around there. 
um, it settled at the stern. And if we look at it a little bit, you'll notice that the pilot house and the smokestack are in the middle of the boat, not like a regular Great Lakes freighter. And in fact, this boat was built in England specifically for Great Lakes service. So here we are with an ocean boat wrecked in Lake Superior in 1905. And then you think, well, the Seaway didn't open until 1959. But quite often what we forget with the Seaway in 1959 is that that was the modern Seaway. We've had a Seaway for well over a century. Um, uh, with, as soon as the Welling Canal uh, was opened in the early 1800s, we had a Seaway of sorts and complete Seaway once the Sioux Locks opened in 1855. So this is an ocean boat wrecked on Lake Superior in 1905. Once the storm was over, and that's what we see here in this view, the wrecking crew came out and looked at the boat, trying to figure out what they were going to do in order to salvage the boat. And they looked at it, and yes, it was solidly aground. So they decided that they would leave the boat where it was because they had a lot of other wrecks, not only to inspect it, but that needed immediate attention for a reasonable salvage. So they left the Monkshaven there in the fall or November of 1905. They came back in the spring of 1906 and looked at the wreck, and it was still solidly aground, hadn't moved much, and they decided they still had a lot of work to do, so they would come back in the fall. So they came back in the early fall, started salvaging the uh, Monk's Haven. They got it pulled off with big pumps, pumping out the water from the cargo hold, got it refloated, pulled it off the rocks, started in toward Thunder Bay with it under tow, got caught in another storm, the pumps quit, and the boat sank. So it, it was really a total loss, almost a, a mile or I'd say a mile and a half from where the initial wreck happened and almost a year after the initial wreck. So kind of an unusual uh, situation with salvage uh, and attempted recovery. Another one of the wrecks is this boat called the Ira H. Owen, um, a real pretty boat. Um, it just simply disappeared out on Lake Superior. It was downbound from Duluth was last seen in the vicinity of the Apostle Islands by another boat that was upbound, um, the Herald B. Nye. Um, they couldn't do anything to assist the Ira H. Owen, which seemed to be having some difficulty struggling in the storm, but there was no way the other vessel could turn around, so they simply passed each other. Uh, this clipping says that the Ira H. Owen is believed to have gone to the bottom. Well, it certainly did. It sank somewhere between the Apostle Islands and, let's say, Antonagon, but we don't know where. It's one of those ships that is still missing out on Lake Superior. It's one of the 350 or so total losses out on Lake Superior and one of the total losses in this Matapa storm in 1905. If and when it's found, it's going to be a really neat discovery because um, it's a large boat. Um, it, excuse me, it has twin smokestacks, um, so it should be fairly easy to identify if it's upside uh, right side up or even um, if it's laying on its side. If it's upside down, um, there'll be a lot of guessing trying to, to figure out what the the boat um, identity really is. So that one disappeared somewhere beyond the Apostle Islands. So the uh, fog signal building over at the Superior Entry uh, was damaged in the storm and uh, Keeper Duty was able to escape just before the, um, the storm damaged the uh, fog signal building there. But it did require that at some point they were gonna have to replace the lighthouse at Superior Entry again as a result of this uh, particular storm. Our main uh, boat, the Matafa, um, Pretty typical oar carrier from the early 1900s, roughly 500 feet long, about 60 feet wide. Very similar to the William A. Irvin uh, here in Duluth, a museum vessel, although shorter. Um, the Valley Camp at Sault Ste. Marie, similar, but the um, Matafa is shorter. And uh, other, other um, freighters around the Great Lakes that are museum vessels are also similar to the Matafa, um, but the Matafa is probably just a little bit shorter at 500 feet. It has an odd name, Matafa. Um, it should probably be pronounced as Mata'afa, using all of the letters in there, pronouncing all of the vowels. Um, Mata'afa himself was the chief of the Samoan Islands. 
And if you ask where are the Samoan Islands, well, if you go out in the Pacific, till you get to uh, Hawaii and turn left, head south, uh, eventually, if you're lucky, you'll get to the Samoan Islands. And that's where he was chief and involved in a lot of, um, <clears throat> excuse me, activity there uh, at the turn of the last century around 1900. He had nothing to do with the Matafa, the boat. He simply had a name that began with the letters M and A. And when uh, Pittsburgh Steamship Company bought the Matafa, uh, renamed it as the Matafa, um, they were looking for words that begin with M and A, and Matafa was one that was uh, available, and they took it. The captain of the Matafa in 1905 was this fellow. Um, his name's Richard Humble, young man. At one point, he was one of the youngest captains on the Great Lakes. Pretty jaunty guy there. You can see him uh, puffing or smoking his uh, cigar there. If he was like my grandfather, he smoked half of it and chewed half of it. So it was kind of a, uh, one of those habits you don't want to get into. Captain Humble was um, pretty good at predicting his own weather. And he had, uh, had the Matafa loaded at the Oidak here in Duluth, and along with her, a consort, a barge um, called the James Naismith was also loaded. And they were ready to go, but because of the storm, they simply waited with several other boats here in the harbor. Once it seemed as though there was a lull in the storm, um, they decided to get underway. Um, yeah, and it turned out to be really just a lull in the storm. It was before that retrograde um, started to happen. Up at the weather station up on the Duluth hillside, up above Skyline Drive, um, Skyline Drive, um, they were still calculating the weather and uh, meteorologist Richardson um, had his flags up warning them about the, the storm to, that was uh, still underway and would be getting worse. Um, Despite the fact that you could see that from the entry and Captain Humble was aware of it, he did put out onto Lake Superior. Now, this particular picture is not the Matapa, but one like it um, headed out into the storm, probably as it would have been uh, when um, the Matapa left. So it was still stormy out there. This is a view of the James Naismith from the Matapa. Looking back, we can see the tow barge. It's on a single line, a single hemp rope that's probably about four to five inches in diameter, uh, anywhere from, say, 500 to 1,000 feet long, um, stretched between the two boats. Here we can see where, when they were loading, the two would have been right close to each other next to the ore dock and loaded with the traditional uh, gravity chutes and loaded with the red iron, natural iron ore. Once out on Lake Superior, they began to realize that maybe the storm was a little bigger than they thought it was going to be. Um, they headed along the Minnesota North Shore up to or toward two harbors. Uh, ordinarily, that trip of about 25 mile, miles would take them maybe two hours on a, on a decent day. It took them more like four hours in the weather they were experiencing. They passed the lighthouse at two harbors. They were seen by the keeper um, headed northeast into the storm. They kept going, and the further they got, they realized that they weren't making any progress. They were simply standing still or being driven backwards by the storm back toward two harbors and Duluth. So Captain Humble decided to turn the two boats around and head back into the shelter of Duluth. That was the plan. So if we think about that now, we've got these boarding seas, we're heading into the wind. Um, we're gonna turn right or the starboard out into the open lake and make our turn. About halfway through that turn, our ship is going to be broadside to the seas. It's a chance that those waves could actually capsize the Matafa. Then think about what's happening with the tow barge. It's back on that line, 500 or 1,000 feet long. So it's uh, kind of wallowing and, and also trying to not capsize as it too gets broadside to the seas. But somehow we managed to turn the two boats around. So now we have again the Matafa leading the uh, James Naismith headed down toward Duluth. But the storm is so strong that it's blowing on the uh, Naismith and giving her a little extra boost. And so sometimes that tow line gets real slack. The uh, Naismith catches up a little and then it slows down and the tow line gets really tight. 
and slack and tight and there's a chance they could part the line, but somehow they managed to get close to Duluth all right. Then as uh, C Captain Humble assessed the situation there uh, at the entry to Duluth, he signaled back to the tow barge that they were gonna drop the tow line, that the Naismith was to anchor out about a mile, maybe a mile and a half offshore. So that's what they did. Now, if I was a sailor back on the Naismith, there are only six or eight people on board. I'm sure that's not what I really wanted to hear. But those sailors rode out the storm pretty good. Um, there were no real injuries. I'm sure they were bounced around, seasick, uh, cold, wet, hungry, all those things. But no one died uh, or major injuries on, on the boat. The Matafa continued as though it was trying to get into the Duluth ship canal. And just as she entered the Duluth ship canal, a huge wave hit the boat at the stern and turned it sideways. And it drove itself right into the pier wall, hit that concrete wall and stove in or bashed in the bow of the ship. Just moments later, she was hitting, 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 hit, let's try that again, was hit at the stern. Um, by another large wave, this one's so big that it turned the rudder around so far that it pushed the rudder right back into the propeller and broke the blades on the propeller. It also lifted the stern up and pushed the bow of the ship right down into the bottom. So the Matafa was now stopped in the water, no way to back out or go forward. It was simply at the mercy of the storm. So. As the storm worked on the boat, what, it, what we'll see is that it pulled it out, turned it at the end of the piers and smashed it right in the middle, cracked it up the side of the ship and across the deck, um, and then turned it around and drove it right into the shallows, not too far off the beach uh, here in Duluth. We're able to see this with um, the actual photographs of the Matafa because the photographer was down here simply to take big pictures of the storm and waves coming over the piers. And the piers had just been completed. Um, work had begun after uh, funding in 1896 and was completed in 1904. So they were just done when this storm uh, hit. So the Matafa was turned around. completely turned around and pushed into the shallows. Now, if you're a sailor here, you might think about, boy, where do you wanna be? You wanna be up in front where it's not too bad, the waves aren't really hitting you, or toward the stern where the waves are really hitting you. So I think I'd rather be up in front. Uh, although I might be one of those who worked at the after end of the ship or my cabin back there and might be stuck back there. So the first thing you think about is, well, the Coast Guard at that time called the Life Saving Service could go right out and rescue the crew of the Matafa. Well, that's what they intended to do, but they were already busy. They were way out on Minnesota Point, about halfway um, to the Superior Entry, um, out where just before the airport out there. Uh, a ship had gone aground out there called the RW England. Um, had run practically up on the beach. Their crew was uh, in danger. And so the life-saving crew had their equipment. Um, they took that out to the uh, RW England and began their work rescuing that crew. And they set up what's called a breaches buoy for rescue. Um, these next couple of images are just um, a practice for a crew, not necessarily in Duluth, it could be anywhere. But the main thing is that little cannon you see in the middle there, um, it's called a Lyle gun. It has a projectile in it, kind of bullet shaped, and to that is attached a light rope, maybe a quarter inch line. And that line you really can't see here uh, very well, but it's coming out of a couple of boxes or um, baskets almost with a, the sailor in white on the right. Um, he's standing next to those, and those are called flaking boxes. And flaking is actually the winding of the rope in there on spindles so that it will come out really easy and really fast uh, when the cannon fires that uh, projectile. It comes out so fast that sometimes the friction is bad enough that it'll start the spindles in the flaking basket. It'll start them on fire or at least get them smoldering. So you do want to, you don't want to be there in front of it and you sure don't want to be on the boat and try and catch the line. You want the line to go up and over the top of the boat. Once the line is out there, you can bring the rest of the breaches buoy equipment onto the ship. You'll tie a high line between, say, the forward mast and the shoreline. 
um, and you'll pull some of the equipment out. That will include a couple of ropes, one, one attached to the boat end, one attached to shoreline, and in the middle, hanging from a pulley on the high line, will be the breeches buoy itself. And the breeches buoy is exactly that. It's a, a, a life ring, a buoy, with a big pair of Bermuda shorts in it. And you simply get into those big shorts, the people on shore will pull you ashore. The people back on the ship will pull the breaches buoy back to the ship. Another person gets in and they get pulled ashore. Then you think about, oh, what happens to the last person on the boat? But if you think a little bit, he simply gets in the breaches buoy and he's pulled ashore. So no one is left on the boat unless they want to. In this case, they did leave a few sailors out there. Um, the captain came ashore to, um, get word into Duluth of, about what had happened and a few stayed with, stayed with the boat under the captain's orders. So once this rescue was over, our life-saving crew had been um, told about the uh, Matafa and that they needed to get back to the ship canal. So they packed up their things into the, um, their beach cart. They did not have the advantage of a horse like this one. Um, they simply had to pull it by hand about two and a half miles through the sand. They didn't have uh, horsepower for their uh, surf boat either. They had to pull that uh, through the sand back to the ship canal. Just beyond where they were working, the, the storm was so bad that it had actually cut through the ship canal, or pardon me, cut through a new ship canal in a way, cut through Minnesota Point, found a new way for, the, for Lake Superior to get into the harbor. Unfortunately, it was on the superior side of where they were working. They got back to the ship canal um, and found that the aerial bridge was not working because of the storm. The waves in the canal were just too high. So that meant they needed a tugboat to get their equipment across the canal. Once they got to the downtown side where the Matafa was, um, they went out on the pier to use the Lyle gun again um, since their uh, lifeboat was not serviceable and, and these kind of waves. Uh, three times they fired the Lyle gun, three times no one on the Matafa could do their end of it. Finally, it was getting dark, the life-saving crew was tired, and it sounded as though Captain Humble had hollered through a megaphone to shore that everyone is forward. Well, it turned out not everyone really was forward. We'll figure that out in a moment. This is what they were looking at. Um, that's the way they're going to spend the uh, time on board the Matapa that first night. The next morning, sunrise, the life-saving crew was rushed back at work and went out to rescue the crew of the Matapa. And what they found were 15 sailors they could save. All of those were in the forward end of the boat. And they found that nine sailors had died. All of those sailors in the back of the boat or that died were from the back of the ship. You can see here in this view of the Matafa, um, this is a different time, um, but if we look closely, we'll find that there are actually 10 guys back there. What we find is that if these were the same people, nine of those died, but one of them, that 10th person, managed to get forward running between the waves, and he was only the only one of those people trapped in the stern um, to get forward. So the nine people that um, did die were all at the stern. Four of them they found frozen to death at the stern. Four of them had washed overboard and eventually their bodies were recovered. And the ninth person was a young sailor in really good shape who thought he could swim ashore. They was so close, but um, he jumped overboard, started to swim and went under and drowned. So there were nine that died in the Matapa. Um, just the one person uh, got forward. This is a, a photo of an actual rescue of the Matapa um, with part of the, the sailors, the 15 that survived from the forward end. What happened to the James Naismith? Well, the barge itself rode out the storm pretty good. Um, it was picked up by another steamer after the storm was over and towed down the lakes to its destination, delivering uh, its, its iron ore successfully. Kind of a summary of the, the ships wrecked. Uh, so seven ships were wrecked, 20 were stranded, and there, there were 25 lives lost in this gale. Um, there was still more to come to end up with the 29 and possibly 30 that were involved. 
you know the storm, storm is over, the rescue has happened. Um, so what do we do? If we're a member of our owner in Pittsburgh Steamship Company, we want to salvage the Matafa, repair it, and put it back to work. The boat is only six years old. There's no insurance on the boat, so no one's going to write us a check. We need to pay for the salvage, get the boat um, into the shipyard, repair it, and back to work. So that's the plan. Meanwhile, of course, people had uh, the whole winter to come down and look at the wreck and see how close to shore it really was. Um, whoever owned the house there at the right had a uh, wonderful beachfront property occasionally, mostly in the midsummer. But here they had a really nice view of the Matapa wreck. Also during the winter, uh, if you lived here in Duluth, you could go out and visit the wreck yourself. Um, you could walk out there, ice skate around it, uh, go up a ladder on, shi on board ship itself. Um, you could have your picture taken out there. Uh, you could look around the wreck, come up with your own ideas on how to salvage it or just leave it, whatever you might want to do. But there were people who really did have to plan for the salvage and that's the group that we see here. And their salvage plan was really simple in its approach, but not so easily to accomplish. There were several steps. Um, the first thing is, um, of course, right where the after mast is, not really below that mast, but it appears so in this photo, you can see there's a large crack that goes down the side of the ship, almost to the bottom, across the deck and down the other side. You can see that the back end or the stern that's toward the ship canal and the lighthouse has settled down. The boilers um, had been put out with uh, incoming water and it just settled to the bottom. The forward end is in a little shallower water. We can see a little bit of the damage at the bow, but we know it's in bad shape. So the plan is uh, what we're going to do is we're going to come along side the ship uh, with some tugs and, and salvage uh, barges. We're going to first um, take out the cargo. We're gonna make the ship lighter. So the, that kind of triangular mess of things off to the right is a stiff leg, stiff leg crane. They're simply scooping out the iron ore, swinging the crane around and dumping the iron ore right into the lake. Now that may sound like they're polluting, but it's just natural red iron ore. So they're turning the color of the water from blue to red, but other than that, they're really not doing much damage. So the entire cargo or almost all the cargo was scooped out that way. So the cargo is not holding the boat down again, but still it's not floating. The next thing was to put a lot of pumps on board and donkey boilers. Now what we see right in the center of the photograph um, right in the center here with the tall smokestack and smoke coming out. That's called a donkey boiler. There's no donkey there. It's just a boiler that's small and portable. We'll see as we look down the deck, there's another one and then one more down here. Those donkey boilers, first we're going to use the steam from there to power up the winches. We see one of the winches right here. And what we're going to do with the winch is we're going to run cable from one end of the boat to the other. And we're going to pull on those cables. We're going to pull as hard as we can and try and close up that gap where the crack is. Once that gap is closed as well as we can, we're going to put some uh, I-beams or timbers down over the crack to stiffen up the boat, keep the crack closed as well as we can. And that's what the man is doing is standing right by one of those timbers. Then we're going to switch the steam pressure from those donkey boilers. We're going to switch it over to some pumps. We see one of the pumps in the foreground there hasn't been hooked up yet. And what we're gonna do with those pumps is we're gonna start pumping water like crazy. They're gonna pump water out of the cargo hold uh, right into Lake Superior. And I've looked at this photo for probably 40 years or more. And it was only a few years ago that I really noticed something. Remember this boat was filled with natural red iron ore. They couldn't scoop it all out. There would still be some left in there. And when it mixed with the water, this water that we see in front of these two guys, even though it's a black and white photo, should be kind of reddish or gray in color here. And it's not, it's just as white as can be. Every speck of iron ore has been washed out of that boat as they pumped so much water through it and not been able to get the boat to move. So they needed to do something else. There were no more pumps to bring out. So the next thing they did was use this. It's a big piece of canvas. And they draped that over the side, right where the crack is. 
It's called a collision blanket, but all it is, it's kind of like a band-aid put over the side of the ship to cover the crack. And the idea is if they pump water out from inside the cargo hold, um, then the water pressure from the lake will push on the canvas, push the canvas into the crack, hopefully seal it up, seal it up enough so that the pumps can overcome the water leaking in, get ahead and get the boat to float. Well, all they were really able to do was get the matafa to wiggle. They couldn't get it to really float. So they had to try something else. Again, there weren't any more pumps. So what they did was something innovative. They had used it before and it worked, was they went and visited the uh, horse barns and stables uh, in the twin ports, and they picked up a lot of manure and straw and brought it back to the wreck itself. Uh, Tricia, I'm going to need help again here, I think. Oh, no, we don't. We're okay, it had locked up for a moment. And they picked up manure and straw from those horse barns in the stables, and they brought that manure and straw back down to the wreck, tucked it in behind the collision blanket. So now as the water from the lake is trying to get through that crack, it's pushing on the collision blanket, the canvas, pushing on the manure and straw, pushing that into the cracks and slowing the water down, slowing it down enough that the pumps can get ahead. And finally, the metapha is refloated. They turn it around and start towing it through the ship canal under the old aerial transfer bridge, which was uh, brand new then in 1905, and we're now in the spring of 1906. We towed it under the bridge, across the harbor, over to the shipyard in Superior, pushed the boat way up into the shallows, turned off the pumps and let it settle to the bottom. That seems like a strange thing to do, but the shipyard was already busy. The dry dock had um, two boats in it um, that were getting repairs. So the Metafa was gonna have to wait until the winter of 1906, 1907 to get its repairs. Once they did get the Metafa into the dry dock, you can see the damage here uh, down in the scaffolding. You can see where the bow was not only pushed in, but it was twisted. Um, if you look up at the top, up by the pilot house, you can see where the forward bulwark is here, and then it stopped, and it looks like there's a piece missing, and it is. That piece was wrinkled up. It was damaged, but not beyond repair, so they simply popped the rivets out, ran it through the roller, and could put that piece right back on. But that whole stem piece, that was had to be replaced totally new, so that was brand new construction in the repair. Back at the back of the boat, at the stern, down in the dry dock, standing down there where we wouldn't ordinarily be below water, we could really see where the damage was and how the Matafa lost its power when it first got hit by those big waves. You can see underneath the, the propeller hub here, we should see four blades of the propeller like a big fan here. Those are broken off. We can see the stern is pushed in here. Just toward us where we're viewing this from should be the rudder. And the rudder is not there, it was lost. So it looks as though the, the rudder was turned, grabbed by the propeller, propeller jammed it up into the bottom of the ship, um, broke off the propeller blades, and, and probably within seconds, you know, 15 or 20 seconds, um, the Matafa went from being a 500 foot steamer to being a 500 foot canoe at the mercy of the storm. So all the repairs were made. 1907, it went back to work as an iron ore carrier. It sailed in the iron ore trade until um, World War II. Then it was retired and sold to another company. Um, was usually is referred to as Nicholson Universal or Nicholson Transit. They were in the business of hauling new cars from Detroit all over the Great Lakes. So they added up on the top of, above the ordinary deck of the Matafa, they added a flight deck and automobiles could be loaded on that flight deck. They could be carried on the main deck uh, just below. And then there was a ramp that took cars or allowed cars to go right down in the cargo hold. Um, this looks like a, um, about a 1950s, maybe, maybe to mid 50s, um, late 40s, uh, early 50s, probably uh, view of the cars on deck. Um, she could carry probably a maximum of around uh, 200 automobiles. By the 1960s, though, this got to be an expensive way to move new cars, and they started using rail and uh, trucks to do it on the new interstate highways. So the Metapa was retired, and it was sold for scrapping to a company in Canada. 
and they kept the boat for a while and they had a chance to sell the Machapa for a profit to another scrapping company. So after some time, they decided to do that. So they sold it to this other company, which happened to be in Germany. So the Matapa was towed across the Atlantic Ocean and it was scrapped in Germany in 1967. Of course, here in Duluth, we were left with uh, not too much of the Matapa. Um, this is the inside of a cigar box, uh, the cover, um, a special uh, cigar, the Matapa cigar, which was ruled by the Duluth Cigar Company. Also, as a result of this storm, um, this lifeline became one of the requirements. It's simply a rope that's attached from the uh, stern cabins to the forward cabins. Now, if you're a sailor in the back of the boat caught on the Matapa, you could hook a line up to uh, this lifeline, uh, run across the top of the hatch covers, and get from the back end to the forward end without much difficulty. There are also lots of other things that happened, and this is where the lighthouses start to come in. The Lake Carriers Association that um, was a group of ship owners that had suffered badly in this storm. Um, they complained about no lighthouses on the North Shore, nothing between two harbors early in, in Canada. So 100, 150 miles of shoreline with no lighthouses. So they complained long enough and loud enough that finally, Lighthouses were built where they had been asking for previously. Up at Isle Royal um, was the Rock of Ages Lighthouse that was built there in 1908. It's right at the Minnesota, just off the Minnesota end of Isle Royal itself, about 25 miles from shore, maybe not quite that far. It was built on the Rock of Ages itself, which was just plainly that, a piece of rock. They had to cut a big donut in the rock then as you look in this photo to the upper middle left there, you can see some iron pieces. They're really like two cylinders, one inside the other, almost like a thermos bottle. And that's the case on, that's gonna be the base of the lighthouse. Between the inner circle, the inner big pipe and the outer big pipe, they're gonna put um, concrete in there, cement, um, and that's gonna form the ba base of the lighthouse. Within the case on itself, they're going to actually form two basements. Um, so they'll have an oil room and a storage room uh, down below the lighthouse as the uh, work continues. Here we can see men are mixing cement right on the boat. Um, this one happens to be called the MC Neff, and the MC Neff was uh, burned uh, after it put some supply, got some supplies up to the bridge at Oliver, Wisconsin, um, just a few miles from here, and that wreck is still up on the St. Louis River. Here they've made more progress. Um, starting to get the upper works together. Again, here, most of the tower has been, at least the steel has been erected. There's a bunkhouse there, so they moved, the men have moved to the work site. You can see this fancy little recreational building out here uh, to the right, and a pretty good line of long underwear and clothes out here that have been laundered. And finally, the lighthouse was completed and ready for operation in 1908. Some have uh, said this is a, that shape um, right there. Some have said that it kind of looks like a, a spark plug. I've got a little one here. Um, it kind of looks like a spark plug. Some have said that it's uh, bottle shaped. Um, I've always kind of thought of it as a spark plug. This one happens to be a champion. Um, they could have said AC on it or, or anything else. It's just the lighthouse is now painted uh, uh, black and white. So the spark plug is not um, the same color. It's the light for the lighthouse. The lens itself was pretty cool. Um, it was described as uh, saying the illuminating apparatus proposed for this station is the first of its kind to be installed in the Great Lakes. Its characteristic will be a double white flash every 10 seconds, which owing to its intensity is known as the lightning light flash. And under ordinary conditions of the atmosphere, it will be, be visible 21 miles. The foundation of the pier of the lighthouse is cylindrical in shape, 50 feet in diameter and 30 feet high. And the focal plane or center of the lantern lens way up at the top will be 115 feet above the level of the lake. This is that lens, it's a second order lens. And the reason it gets the two quick flashes is because of the two bullseyes that are so close together that they actually overlap in a way. The opposite side or the back side of this lens is exactly the same. 
So it's a clamshell um, lens and it has double bullseyes on both sides. So it comes around, does a flash flash, then it goes around about 15 seconds later, you'll get another flash flash, then about 15 seconds later, you'll get another flash flash. This is in the, uh, the lens is in the ranger station at Windigo Isle Royal uh, on display there. Um, the superintendent, of construction, superintendent for construction on the, this lighthouse was Ralph Russell Tinkham. Um, and while he was working on the split of the uh, Rock of Aces lighthouse, he was also finishing up his design for Split Rock Lighthouse. So he simply moved down the shore. Once uh, Rock of Aces was completed, they had already picked out a place for him to build the lighthouse. And it was just a plain rocky point along the shore. Um, they hoisted the materials up uh, right over the cliff um, in the beginning of construction. Later, they moved things up a tramway, which is off to the left, up to finish, and in this case, the fog signal building. Down behind is an oil house. The tower is going up. There were three uh, keepers' quarters, and behind them, there eventually there'll be uh, barns or stables built. So it's quite an elaborate uh, station. Um, this is the most obviously the most visited lighthouse in the Twin Port or in the Minnesota area. Uh, almost as many visitors as we have here. Um, they do play a recording of the fog signal building, and it's uh, quite an experience to be up there at Split Rock. But remember, this was built as a result of that 1905 storm. Uh, up at Split Rock, when they interpret it up there, sometimes they'll call it the storm of the century, the Metaphys storm, the big blow of 1905. It has a lot of names, but it's still the Metaphys storm from 1905. So quite an elaborate um, operation, um, elaborate structure up there. Down at Superior Entry, changes were taking place too. Once the crews had finished um, redoing the piers in Duluth in 1904, they moved over to the Superior Entry and started redoing the piers that we see here at the Superior Entry. But because of the way things happened at the Duluth Entry, they decided they were going to modify the plans and they were going to build two long breakwaters out from the shoreline. They're arrowhead breakwaters. And what they're doing with the, this construction is they're uh, with the two breakwaters, they're going to create inside or between them a stilling basin. And you can kind of see that here, um, out where the boat is just coming in from Lake Superior. Um, we can see it's kind of blue out there. If there are waves, there'd be re reasonable waves out there. Once they came into here where we see more of the mud stirred up, it's a quieter area, easier to enter the, the ship canal piers themselves and easier to get into the harbor. Also, these two piers are 500 feet apart instead of 300 feet like the Duluth entry. While we're there at Superior, we're going to build a brand new lighthouse to replace the one that was toppled into the uh, lake here. And this is a Superior entry breakwater light. And it's a kind of an interesting lighthouse and it's built of poured concrete rather than brick or stone. It has an interesting shape if you look at it down from the top. Um, it's about the same shape as a, a running track or a NASCAR track. Um, so it's kind of neat. It's rounded at both ends with uh, straight sides. It's not a true oval. In fact, this particular shape is called a sta stadium oval. Not too far away from the Superior Entry is the old Minnesota Point Light, the one that was built in 1858 and the one that became the zero point for the surveys of uh, Lake Superior and particularly Duluth Harbor. The old lighthouse there, this is what it looked like. The tower was about 40 feet up to the lantern room and then probably another eight or 10 feet, probably 10 or 12 feet, maybe up to the uh, with a full lantern uh, atop there. It's another view of it. This one was colorized to make it into a postcard. All that's left today is the tower itself. And let's see, we're hung up again. Okay, let's try one spot over here. Here we go. 
This shows uh, from this old view what the tower looks like. Um, it's pretty much the same right now. If you look just beyond the tower out near where the boat is there, you can see some wooden works and a lot of uh, posts driven in. That's trying to stabilize the shoreline. There was really erosion out there that was the reason that um, they went for a different lighthouse. Also at, at the Duluth entry, the, the lighthouse on the North Pier was built uh, as a result of this storm to mark the other pier coming into Duluth. Um, this one, if you go out there and visit, you'll see that just above the door is uh, cast right into the structure. It says 1909, but it was actually, that's when it was manufactured. It was actually erected or built in 1910. You can see the old uh, lighthouse, the front and the inner range lights um, that were replaced during that construction of the uh, Duluth Ship Canal uh, right at the turn of the century. This is the, the new front range light or the outer uh, South Pier Lighthouse. It's a brick structure. And then the inner range light. The fortunate here in Duluth at the, at the Marine Museum, um, in the museum's displays, um, they do have the lenses, the Fresnel lenses from all three of these lighthouses on display. So it's really uh, pretty spectacular when we can get open again. This shows the tower and here we can see it has four sides. It's an open skeletal pyramid, a frustum of a pyramid with up here at the top, we have the uh, watch room flooring up here, the, the walkway or um, catwalk around the outside of the watch room. And then up at the lantern level, there's another uh, walkway or gantry around the outside there. And we talked a little bit of, uh, in the beginning, just mentioned uh, Twin Ports Lighthouse Day. It's really Lighthouse Day nationally. And the reason August 7th, uh, tomorrow was picked as this, uh, President George Washington signed the ninth act of Congress on August 7th of 1789, federalizing the lighthouses. Those lighthouses that were built by the colonies and the states were brought into a federal system. And it was the first public works act of the new nation. Um, and it's this date that we uh, celebrate as Lighthouse Day. Also, we certainly don't want to forget Bagas and Jean Fresnel, a Frenchman, who uh, was also an engineer. He worked for Napoleon, um, more as a civil engineer, but he had a fascination with light and op optics. And from his work, he developed the what we know now as the Fresnel lens that focuses and intensifies um, the light uh, in the lighthouses. And something a lot of people don't know or don't recognize is that there's a castle behind many of the lighthouses. And most people just don't notice. Maybe it's behind the lighthouse, maybe it's underneath. And it's really um, has to do with several things. Uh, Army engineers who were detailed to design and build, light, build lighthouses under the most difficult conditions, such as offshore and sandy bottoms or tiny islands and narrow reefs, both on the oceans and on the Great Lakes. Um, several famous uh, Army engineers were involved with the lighthouse uh, construction and design. Uh, superintending uh, General Ulysses S. Grant, if he's the President of the United States, was one of those. Major General Godfrey Weitzel, um, namesake of the former lock in the St. Mary's Falls Ship Canal at the Sioux. Uh, General George G. Meade, who superintended or got started the 1861 survey of the harbor, uh, producing what's known as the Meade map. Um, using the zero point uh, of the lighthouse to establish that baseline. And this person who really did a lot with lighthouses, General Orlando M. Poe, who was the namesake of the big Pollock and the former Pollock at the Sioux. He was also on the lighthouse board, designed many lighthouses, and he had a very distinctive design, was a tall, narrow, tapering, um, you know, frustum of uh, the cone there, uh, up to the top and rather ornate up in the gallery area in the lantern. And we'll see that um, this is over in the outer island 
uh, of the Apostle Islands. And this clip kind of comes from that era, time and, and that lighthouse. It says, responsibility for the design of stations was that of 11th District Engineer, Reverend Brigadier, Brigadier General Orlando M. Poe. Outer Island was apparently his initial lighthouse design. Outer Island's tapering tower shows his distinctive design with a tall conical form and corbial detail below the gallery catwalk. And we'll talk about Corbeil in just a moment, or Cor Corbeil. At the end of the Civil War, Poe assumed, po assumed the position of engineer secretary of the Lighthouse Board in 1865, in which he, uh, capacity he was charged with supervision of building projects. In 1870, he was promoted, promoted to chief engineer of the Upper Great Lakes Lighthouse District. In this capacity, Poe was responsible for all lighthouse construction, and he was largely responsible for design, design of a style of lighthouse tower that has become known as the Poe style. These towers are all tall brick structures with a gentle taper from bottom to top. All of the Poe design features graceful embellishment, embellishments in the form of masonry gallery support corbels, uh, arched tops above the windows, and altogether, Poe was responsible for construction of a number of such towers on Lake Superior, Lake Michigan, and Lake Huron. And this just shows what a corbel or corbeal is. Um, this case is just a support used for a mantle, still called a corbel. corbel. At the Duluth entry, the, uh, really the supports that hold up the catwalk are corbels. These on the Duluth entry, I'm not sure if they're decorative or not, uh, in the construction of uh, posed lighthouses, the structure that we see on the outside is only about half of the real structure. The real structure goes back through the masonry, so it really does functionally support um, the floor uh, area just above it, that uh, catwalk there. So, do we have any questions? Is anyone left? <laughs> I didn't see any questions yet, Tom, but while we are waiting, we'll talk a little bit about our uh, visitor center's status. Okay. Well, uh, most a lot of you know that our visitor centers have both been closed uh, since March. Uh, our visitor center in Duluth, we are still providing visitor services outside. We are doing vessel announcements and um, we do have cell phone tours available for people to learn more about the Canal Park area. We also got a virtual online tour of our museum and also a boat hotline that people can call. And uh, we do have our gift shop uh, set up outside so people can uh, visit that as well. At Sault Ste. Marie, the Sulax Visitor Center, they have uh, created all of their inside exhibits and or modified them and made them outside exhibits. So all of their inside exhibits are hanging out outside so people can visit, view them. Their park is open, but their uh, observation platform and their visitor center are not open at this time. They also are doing uh, vessel announcements and providing outdoor visitor assistance. And we will both open when we can comply with state and federal guidance and when local conditions permit. And finally, just a little bit of information about our uh, upcoming program next week. On August 13th, we will have a special guest, Bruce Lynn from the Great Lakes Shipwreck Historical Society will be giving a program about the U.S. life-saving service on the Shipwreck Coast uh, around Whitefish Point and Pictured Rocks area of Upper Michigan. That will be at 11 a.m. Central or 12.30 p.m. Eastern. We will also have the recorded version of this program that we just did and all of our other programs available, um, primarily on the uh, USACE Detroit District YouTube channel. 
We'll also advertise them on our Facebook pages that are listed on top and then the CORE's website and our association website. And then these are the phone numbers for our respective uh, vessel hotlines. So wherever you are watching, you can give that a call if you're in Duluth or at the Sioux. And harborlookout.com is our online vessel schedule. And we've also got an email list that you can be on if you so choose. If you just want to send a message to hello lsmvc at gmail.com, you can be on our email list and be uh, made aware of our upcoming programs. And we've also got a few minute survey that you can take. Uh, the address is on the bottom here. And that will just help us uh, plan our events a little bit and give us some feedback on our virtual programs that we've got. Now, let's look at the questions. Okay, so someone asked, did they ever find the body of the guy who jumped to shore? Yes, as far as I know, all of the um, nine crewmen from the stern that died back there, um, all of those bodies were recovered, including the one fellow that jumped overboard. Uh, one of the kind of you know, odd things, I guess, is that um, because there were so many, you know, 25 or so um, the bodies that were recovered from shipwrecks and brought into Duluth, um, they ran out of space to really store the bodies. And at least one body ended up being stored uh, in the, in the uh, a refrigerated um, meat chest or display chest in one of the local butcher shops. So um, there were a lot of deaths. Um, associated with this storm, and yes, as far as I know, all the bodies from the from the Matapa were recovered. Interesting. Yes. Thanks, Tom. And then absence of good visibility and lights during a storm, like the one in 1905. What navigation methods, other than dead reckoning, were available to mariners during that time? Really, the uh, dead reckoning was pretty close to it. Um, there wasn't much for, there really were no other other things be, besides, uh, say, a wind sock that would tell you uh, maybe a little bit what the intensity of the wind is, but what direction it was coming from, and a magnetic compass, um, and then a, a watch or a clock, um, and then the taffrail log that went out behind the boat on a long line, and it, it spun like a little uh, torpedo with a propeller to indicate the speed of the boat. But basically you were at the, at the uh, that spitting into the wind, uh, running by the seat of your pants. Um, there was no radio direction finder. There was no radio, no telegraph. Um, no, of course, no cell phones and television and that kinds of thing. Once, once you left the harbor and could no longer see um, the harbor entry or the weather flags up on the hillside, you were on your own. You were your own little island uh, fighting with the storm and using your best based on your past experience, what you thought the storm was going to do and how it would impact your boat. Thanks for that, Tom. And do you have, during this storm, do you have one a favorite shipwreck story from the storm? Well, I think the Metapha has always been the kind of the lead of the storm. Um, she got her name stuck on it, and not because it was the first or the last or the worst. It was just that her norm, her name got stuck in the storm because so many people were down here to watch it, and it was actually photographed. Um, so I guess the Matafa and then the, the, her strange name coming from uh, a chief in the Samoan Islands um, is kind of interesting. There were lots of Pittsburgh steamers like the Matafa that had uh, a wreck in this storm. Others like the Madeira, which is wrecked up at Split Rock, um, the Meliatoa, Manila, Manoa. Um, there were others that wrecked in this same storm. Uh, from the Pittsburgh Steamship Company. So I guess probably the Metapha is, is the one, although the salvage and recovery or attempted recovery of the, the Monk Shaven is also kind of a favorite. And I, I, even though it's not well documented, I do like the at least the legend about how it got its name as Monk's Haven. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, let's. Okay, so another question or a question about the IRA H. Interesting info about the IRA H. Have you heard any tales about searches trying to locate it? Um, the IRA H Owen is still one of those missing vessels. Um, it's probably in really deep water, which doesn't encourage a lot of searching. And there are no real clues to even, you know, within five miles of where the boat actually sank. Um, there were bits and pieces that were found anywhere from the Apostles all the way to the Keweenaw Peninsula. So there's just so much of Lake Superior, maybe a hundred miles stretch or more where the boat could possibly be. And if it uh, capsized, um, it could have drifted uh, upside down um, for days and days and days before it finally sank. So without a real good location um, to search, it'll probably, when it's found, it'll probably be an accident. Um, kind of like the um, one of the recent finds in the Apostle Islands, the antelope was discovered um, when the fellows um, were just coming back from an unsuccessful wreck search. They kept the sonar on just in case, and they were in the area they had looked before for the antelope and just stumbled across it. So um, it'll probably be found that way. Um, it's just too expensive and time consuming to just plainly go out and search without a reasonable uh, expectation of finding something. Okay, great. And then we've got another question. Were any of the crew members from the Matafa from Duluth or Superior? To that question, I really don't have an answer. I don't know. Um, whether um, the crew members came from uh, Duluth or Superior. Um, they probably in uh, one, of, one of the books, um, maybe Abrahamson's might indicate that, but I don't really know. Usually you find uh, a, a sailor's name and position on the boat, not necessarily um, their hometown. And I'm just not aware of any. Um, the information is probably out there. I just don't know it. Okay. It's a good research project for someone. Okay, we can wait a couple more minutes if any, if we had any final questions, but Tom, I just wanted to thank you again for continuing to be involved with the Visitor Center and for sharing your knowledge with everyone. It's been fun. Um, really enjoy the chance to still stay uh, in touch after, even after retirement. <laughs>